everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of The Jumps Show. Another episode in the series of anti-post Cheltenham tips and bets and perhaps some pointers along the way as well. Thanks so much for the amazing support thus far. We are on the road to a thousand subscribers on the channel. Please do help us out by liking and subscribing. If you think of it as a kilometre, we've sprinted for most of it and now at the last stretch, that finishing line is in sight, which is the festival. And we would love to hit that goal, I have to say. Um, just an announcement to tell you about before we begin. On Thursday next week, the Jump Show crosses with Let's Talk Racing for a Cheltenham preview live stream. That is not to be missed. It should be fairly informative if you take myself out of the equation. But the other four <laughs> are going to tell you an awful lot about the handicaps, I imagine, because that is where the focus is going to be. That's on Thursday, the 2nd of March, 9 p.m. UK time. Don't miss that. It's on YouTube Live and it'll be found on the Jump Show channel. So another reason, of course, to subscribe. Once again this week, delighted to be joined by both Dan Overall and Jake Price as well. Chaps, I hope you're really well. Great to see you. And uh, Dan, let's start with you by looking back at some of the racing from last week, particularly midweek action to begin with. And that was the Mercedes-Benz novice hurdle, a three-mile novice that saw the, at the time, Albert Bartlett's favourite, Hidden Valley Lake, who was in the end beaten by Monty Starr. But I thought that was a, a decent effort considering he was giving him six pounds. Yeah, in, in a few weeks that's probably been devoid of midweek action for the most part, this was a, a rare treat, I would say. Great race in the end, as you say. Monty Starr looked uh, a huge scopy horse. Like the way he travelled through the race, you'd have to think he's a horse with some serious potential for the future. I guess the issue was going to be towards the business end after travelling so well and almost maybe looking a bit raw. Would he be able to find in a battle but credit to him he did manage to knuckle down and get the job done obviously was getting weight from Hidden Valley Lake who obviously connections afterwards said he probably didn't like the ground didn't jump well out in front so definite excuses for him in that regard can definitely see him still going to the Albert Barlet as a, a live contender as he searched for glory back in third wasn't far away either just seemed to get outpaced at a crucial stage but Another boost to the good land form, uh, which just seems to get stronger and <laughs> stronger with with every week, much to my annoyance. <laughs> it's, but it was a great race. I'd say that's going to be a much discussed one in the build up to the Albert Bartlett. I think all three would have claims to various degrees. So the front two, obviously, for Henry, a, a race he knows well, and a, the Albert Bartlett a race he knows very well as well. Uh, both different types, but both have very valid claims going to Cheltenham. Who would you have as the kind of supremo coming out of that race for the for the contest? For the Bartlett, just the way I think the race tends to be for the here and now, I I would side with Hidden Valley Lake as a prospect longer term. I I would go with Monty Star, but again, it's it probably isn't massive amounts between them. I, I, Monty Star is such a beautiful stamp of the horse, though, isn't he? Like he, he looks like a one you'd love to send over the fences as soon as possible, but. For the here and now, maybe Hidden Valley Lake might just be the more Bartlett-esque type. Yeah, I mean, it's probably fairly obvious uh, comparison to make, but I have to say that Monty Star in those silks reminds me very much of Miller Rindo as a hurdler. And of course, he went and won the Albert Bartlett before winning the Gold Cup a little bit later down the line. Uh, Jake, what did that race do to your impression of the Albert Bartlett novice hurdle? Yeah, well, I have to say I was initially quite disappointed in Hidden Valley Lake's performance, to be honest. Um, you know, with with the Emmett Mullins horse coming out on the morning, it looked like a you know weak enough race for him to go and win. But as Dan mentioned, there are uh, I think there are plenty of positives to take out of it. To be honest, um, no less obviously he was giving away six pounds for what looked like two nice horses. Um, he had to make his own running as well, which you know I don't think that's the type of the style of race that he would want to run. I think he'd be much happier settling in behind the pace in in an Albert Bartlett. And then be able to use, he does have quite a decent turn of foot, or the, seemingly he did, a, a cork anyway. So I think he'd be able to use that a lot better in, in an Albert Bartlett where he's got a lead. Um, he doesn't have to make the running. And as um, Dan mentioned, you know, the soft ground seemingly didn't help him either, according to connections. So I think there's plenty of positives to take out of it. I think he's still got a great chance in the Bartlett, albeit at a bigger price than the one that I put him up at. Um, and yeah, I echo the thoughts on Monty Star. He, he looks like a horse that's going to be a you know, a really good stay and chaser in the future. So, yeah, I think there's plenty of positives, even though it looked like a disappointing performance. Yeah, I think a race with a, a plethora of pointers for the future was that Mercedes-Benz novice hurdle. On to Gorham Park on Saturday, we saw the Red Mills hurdle trial. 
And that featured Field Door, who wasn't really fancy, drifted to around about four to one, I think, at the off, returning to hurdles as Charger was backed into four to seven. Charger made a, a horlix of a mistake down the back straight, which definitely knocked some of the stuffing out of him. But he had every chance coming to the last. Field Door, as is his want over hurdles, seems to always find plenty for pressure. Jake, what did you make of this? Yeah, it was a bit of a uh, bit of a mod race, to be fair. Um, but the thing with Phil Dorn now is he's proven that he just loves softer ground. He's now four from four from four on softer or, or, or slower ground. So, yeah, I think I think he's 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 kind of proving himself as a bit of a mud like, but he definitely stays two mile really well. Um, a step up in trip on better ground would probably be something that would help him. Um, so perhaps they could look at something like a coral cut. Maybe I, I don't know exactly what the plans are for him. Um, I think I'll leave Sharjah out of out of it to, to down to cover. But in terms of Doctor Bravo and third, I thought he was the the real eye catch in the race as well. I mean, he was getting a chunk of weight, um, but I think he's a really, really nice horse for the future. Um, he lo he looks like a chaser. He's he's rated 135 in Ireland now. I don't imagine that Cheltenham's the plan for him. I'd imagine they'll probably keep him at home. Um, there's a Grade Three um, novice hurdle at Nice on like the weekend before Cheltenham, which might be right up his street. Um, but yeah, so I, I think he's a horse to, to take out of it and for perhaps, you know, for next year or, or even maybe the spring back in Ireland, but maybe not one for Cheltenham. Good stuff. Um, Dan, what did you make of it? I think everyone was a little bit surprised that uh, Sharjah's short price was overturned. Mm, well, a bit of a spoiler, but we'll get to Sharjah later because I had my eye on a race for him that may or may not be in three weeks' time. So we'll, we'll get to Sharjah <laughs> later. Uh, Phil Dorr, is a, a, I think it was just good placing, really. Like, they're in a bit of a rock and a hard place situation, I guess, to a certain extent. Obviously, he's still just only a five-year-old, has exposed. He's, he's now won't be a novice next season, but it looks like they're going to stick to hurdles for the time being, as Jake mentioned. In time, you think he's going to appreciate some stiffer tests of stamina over fences on softer ground, like some decent handicaps should be within range. I wouldn't really be overly interested in him for a Cheltenham handicap, given the likely quicker conditions and his mark's going to obviously suffer for this. Uh, and Dr. Bravo as a horse, well, I'm just another boost to Dark Raven's form. Uh, so to the Ballymore, <laughs> please, lads. Uh, just <laughs> honestly, I'm just all my all the horses I've got for Novice Hurdles form is so good and they're probably not going to run in the races. <laughs> it makes me physically sick. But there you go. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll discuss Charger uh, towards the end of this show. Gonna have to start calling you Dan the Dark Raven overall, I think. Literally, um, I, I love that horse, but he's just gonna, he's not gonna show up. <laughs> I just know it. It hurts, <laughs> but you know, I'm used to this. It's what I do. People know me. I put up non runners. <laughs> it's my speciality. Well, at least you don't put up horses that can't win, like me, apparently. <laughs> um, <laughs> what a duo we make. Yeah. <laughs> right, moving on to Wing Canton, the Kingwell Hurdle, and shouts of, I like to move it. We're going around Wincanton because he absolutely bolted in in that race. I mean, I'll give my impression of the contest, first of all, very briefly. Um, I thought Brani Frost and Napa's Hill went off way too quickly. And that was then done, I think, with about a couple of furlongs to go. It was just too strong a pace. And then in behind, First Street, to me, never really looked that happy in the race, um, which I think left, I'd like to move it as the only one, really, who was going to run his race. I don't know what you thought, Dan. Yeah, on first street, I'm just not sure he has the tactical speed for two miles on good ground, really, in deep races. Like, even if you go back to the county hurdle, I know he finished second in it last year, but he got badly outpaced coming down the hill that day and then stayed on. I just don't think it really suits him. And I'm not sure two and a half is necessarily his bag either. He seems a bit tripless at the minute and maybe just on a mark stiff enough for handicaps as well. But obviously, I like to move it. You really have to be impressed. But that came out a bit out of nowhere. Like, that was another step up from his Greatwood win. Obviously, I know that's probably going to lead to people fancying Jin Coco for the county as well, uh, based on that. I'm not sure that's necessarily the best line to pull for it, because that's clearly an improved performance there, and the race has somewhat fallen apart. But you'd have to be impressed by the way he travelled through and then powered to the line. I think afterwards, Nigel said, like, as a hurdler, he's up there with Kai Kim and the new one, in terms of horses he's trained over hurdles, and they were both placing champion hurdles. And again, you'd probably think a similar fate might await him. Obviously, he's, I mean, Mark 157 now. Like, he's only really got one place to go over hurdles, and that will be the champion hurdle. And he's earned his spot there, but it would probably only be good enough for second, third, or probably or fourth, something like that. But good horse, and interesting to see what they do next year if they try and pot hunt with him over two miles, or if they go novice chasing. Either way, he's an interesting type going forward. 
Yeah, he is. If you'd thrown State Man into that Kingwell hurdle on Saturday, what do you think the distance between himself and I like to move it would have been? I think the test probably wouldn't have been as necessarily keen for State Man, like very sharp two miles. I'm, I'm not sure if that would have been entirely his bag. Um, I think there's no probably doubting State Man's a better horse than I like to move it. But I don't think there would have been much between them given those conditions. Like That's something I like to move. It seems to really relish, really quick ground, sharp track. So probably would have been fairly close, to be honest, especially if State Man went forward and took on Napa's Hill. Could have blown it wide open. Yeah, very interesting thoughts, actually. Um, Jake, I know you're a, a maestro of the dance floor. What did you make of I Like to Move It? <laughs> um, yeah, I thought it was a very impressive performance. And look, I don't, I don't think he's going to go and win a champion hurdle, but we need horses like him to go and run in a champion hurdle and make up these numbers and give it some depth. Like, we, we just do. I mean, I was looking through the field of, of what might turn up, and we're probably going to get a maximum of eight, like, and that's best case scenario, I'd say. Yeah, that's exactly. Um, so, yeah, look, we, we need horses like him to run in the race. I think he'll run well in a champion hurdle. I could I could see him getting third ahead of maybe a Vauban, perhaps, if, if he gets to run the race and he, and he, and he puts in a similar performance. Um, obviously, he's got, got a lot more to find with the other two. But, yeah, I, th I thought it was a very fair performance, fair play to him. And... Yeah, like Dan, I, 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 first three is not really on my radar. He, he was left on a mark of 152. If he got dropped a couple of pounds, you could perhaps make the argument. But I think on that mark, he's only entered in the county. Not really for me. Yeah, it wouldn't be for me either, I have to say, Jake. Um, let's move on to the final race we're going to talk about in the review section. And that was one that was quite painful for me to watch, actually, which was <laughs> Hoton Couleur getting beaten by Janadil. And it was a bit of a, a kind of sad few hours for me on Saturday really because I was all over the fact that Shishkin was going to get beaten and then Hoton Couleur <laughs> would win and the Donnellys would think to themselves let's supplement Hoton Couleur for the Ryanair now I, I literally couldn't have been more wrong so I will <laughs> hold my hands up and say yes I really am a moron um, <laughs> Rachel, <Tip that>. uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely yeah that could be like a meme um, yeah the, 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 the race itself was I, thought, I just think Hoton Couleur is starting to really find any way of not winning a race. He should have won that contest. He was the travelling the strongest coming to two out. He looked to throw his toys out the pram a bit. And then when Janadil went past, he thought to himself, actually, I'll try and chase him and see if I can get a bit. And he did come back at the end. I just think he threw it away a bit. Um, Jake, what did you think of the race? Yeah, well, I had a vested interest in it, to be honest, because I put up Janadil for the Ryanair beforehand with a similar thinking to you in terms of wanting him to go and run well here and then, I think, you know, the vibes with William Munns were definitely that he'd come on for the run. So I was hoping just to finish a good first or second. Well, you know, second really uh, would have been fine. This is, the, this, is where you're, this is where you're a judge and I'm not. So that, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it was a price thing because he was up at 25 and he finished second in the race last year. So, it, it, you know, it didn't take, you know, too much to put that one together. But yeah, I was very impressed with Janadil, to be honest. Um, I was watching him obviously the whole way around and he jumped every fence really well, barring the last, to be honest. And... He just wasn't making any ground on the flat, which is kind of what you'd expect for a horse who, who you know, is going to come on for the run. Um, but Rachel Blackmore gave him an ice cool ride. She, you know, she just waited and waited and waited. And I was thinking, come on, Rachel, let's make a move now. Let's make a move now. And she waited until the last minute, swept past the field and went on and, you know, scored quite nicely. So, yeah, I think you have to be impressed with Jan Adil in terms of coming on for that run even more for the Ryanair. But as we'll touch on in a minute, I think that dream in terms of win part, it may have gone in about five minutes, but um, it, was, it was still, you know, a very good performance from Janadil. Um, and yeah, I, I was impressed by it. Yeah, I, I was impressed with the turn of foot he showed uh, coming down to the last down. Yeah, it was a, a decent enough performance. Obviously a bit of a strange race. Uh, I think all horses in there kind of had a few questions and probably a few remaining still. Obviously Horton Glory, yeah, it's just a bit of a bit of a shirker at this stage. I'm, I'm not sure he could really be interested in for anything. Uh, moving forward, handicaps or graded races. Otherwise, I guess it was a reason he wasn't entered in those races to begin with. And perhaps they knew he just probably wasn't up to that standard regardless. Obviously, as Jake mentioned, Janney was second in the Ryanair last year. It was a good race for second, actually. Uh, that was between El Dorado Allen and Conflated. And the right battle. I mean, admittedly, Alaho was 15 lengths ahead. and But <laughs> if you looked in behind, there was a nice little race going on. Um, so obviously, he's got that going for him. He, he narrowly beat El Dorado Allen out that day. But obviously, I think he's probably, what, a mid-160s horse on his day and he, he could be running into a, a high 170s performer at his best come Cheltenham. So 
I, I don't know what price he is now for the Ryanair, but I imagine he's probably single figures after that run. And at that stage, he wouldn't interest me anymore. But uh, yeah, he, the Ryanair has definitely developed since we last spoke about it. I know on Capadano as well, I think they'll probably work back from Punchestown with him, uh, given he won the grade one of his chase. Uh, their last season over three miles. I'd probably go for the Punchestown Gold Cup. Uh, I can't see why they chuck him in at Cheltenham. Seems to go well at Punchestown. So that could be his end goal. Okay, lovely stuff. Concludes our section of reviewing the racing from the weekend and the week previous. Uh, just to update you with some news. And Blazing Cal has suffered a mine setback. I don't think it's anything to be too concerned about, but obviously this stage before Cheltenham. It's not Another really one. Supporters of Blazing Cow, particularly here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Galvin is on course to run in the cross country chase, which is very well it surprised me anyway. Um, Marla Mission on track for the National Hunt Chase. Whee! <laughs> so, um, thank God for that. <laughs> someone on this podcast. Yeah, it'll it finish very, well yeah, in second behind Gaia de Manil. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, not to be defeatist. Um, <laughs> no. Tom, Mr. Tom Scudamore was retired, already announced his retirement this week after a couple of falls, but a, a fantastic career he's had. So, congratulations on that, and um, best of luck to him with whatever he chooses to do in the future. But uh, yeah, he's had some some time with the likes of Western Warhorse and Tom Poor Two, Thistlecrack, of course, uh, Dynast, Lockderg, Grand Cru, plenty of, of brilliant horses he's ridden in the past. And Bristol Demai, an equine beast that has been retired this week. At, a stalwart of the Haydock turf and one that used to make the Betfair chase very much his own. So, um, yeah, sad to see him retire, but also very happy at the same time. He's retired unscathed. And finally, Brandy Love and Queen's Brook declared for the Quebega Mayor's Hurdle. That should be very informative, has to be said, because um, Brandy Love has run out of chances, really, to, to have a run before, before Cheltenham. So this could be her last, her last hurrah. Hopefully she'll run a good race. Right, lads, moving on to handicaps for the Cheltenham Festival. And Jake, starting with you, I'm looking forward to this little soliloquy, <laughs> panegyric, which I'm hoping you're about to, to uh, release to the world. Um, notable entries and emissions from handicap hurdles. Yeah, this is one of mine and Dan's favourite days of the year. This and next week for the wait. So, uh, God, we're sad, Excuse us. We, we are very oh sad, yes. <laughs> Excuse us for being giddy, but um, yeah, it's getting serious now with the handicap. So here we go. Um, handicap hurdles, yeah, I'm going to touch on, then Dan will do the chases. So firstly, there's been two big stories, basically, with the handicap hurdles today. Firstly was West Cork. Um, <laughs> so there was a bit of a hoo-ha about him this morning. So he got dropped £5, which was very generous by the British handicapper, to a mark of 134 for his latest run. Um, everyone was getting really excited about that. And then Dan Skelton went and didn't enter him in the county hurdle. So <laughs> he will not be running. Um, I had so much even, fun with that this morning. You have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> was There was even like people saying afterwards that actually he was entered for some reason. Um, but no, he's definitely not entered. So <laughs> you can cross him off your list. And then the other story came in the Martin Pipe, really, um, where we discussed him recently. I know the way you're thinking. Um, he didn't get an entry in the race either. So... Um, that was a bit more of an odd one. I, I don't know if there's a problem there. I don't think he was entered in anything. Um, and also Absolute Notions and Dawn Rising also didn't get entries in that race. So quite a few of the head of the market have come out there. Um, yeah, so away from that, there wasn't really any surprises in the handicap hurdles, to be honest. Uh, there's no comfort zone in the boodles, but you know he'll probably go to the Triumph. And Gaelic Warrior didn't get any entries across the handicaps either, which I guess we were expecting, to be honest. Um, in terms of interesting entries, though, we've got Sharjah is in the County Hurdle, Brandy Love and Horton Claws are also in the Coral Cup, which is interesting. Um, quite annoyingly, actually, Ron Froska is entered in the Coral Cup, but everyone seems to have noticed it already. And he's now into like eight to one, which is, yeah, I thought he'd be a bit of a sneaky one, but clearly not. Um, and Zana here is also another entry towards the head of the markets, uh, sorry, to, to, towards the head of the weights. And he's in the Coral Cup in County. So he would be an interesting runner if you were to turn up in a handicap. Um, and I've also gone through and checked my handicap selections and for the for the hurdles. Um, I'm the only one who's actually put up a handicap hurdle so far, apparently. Um, but they're all entered. So Jazzy Matty in the Boodles, Iker Allen in the County and Spanish Harlem in the Pipe. Hi, hi. Well done, Jake. That is, that's the first <laughs> battle won. It really yeah. is. Very impressive stuff. Um, Dan, on to you and I think um, the chases. Yep, on to the chases. And I'm happy to say we have Lord Accord and three under three five in the Ultima. Lord Accord is also in the Kim Muir, but Ultima seems to be the plan. So that's all good. Fast or slow is in the plate. 
also in the Ultima, but surely they can't go from the Dublin chase to the Ultima. That would be absolutely outrageous. Um, and Andy, the frames in the Grand Annuals, so unbelievably at this time. Normally, I've, all of mine don't get entered, and it's just a disaster. Uh, but they're actually all in currently, uh, which is a rare victory. Uh, so I'm going to celebrate them while they come, because they don't happen too often. This is, uh, this is the greatest podcast in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and when they're all tailed off last, I can say at least they got there. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we had the value, lads. We had the value. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, other ones that I think are notable, Mr. Coffee is National Hunt Chase bound. He got no Kim Yor entry, so they've struck too true to their word there. Indigo Breeze is one that's not in the Ultima or the Kim Yor. I know I'd have, a few had their eye on him going up in trip after he looked a bit outpaced of a two and a half at the Dublin Racing Festival. And in the Grand Annual, Haddad is Oboe, Boot Hill and So Scottish all not entered. Uh, the latter is in the plate and obviously is the short price market leader for such a couple of interesting ones I pointed out for, for a variety of reasons, really. Uh, Dino Blue in the Grand Annual. Uh, obviously, I know Willie Mullins' record in handicap chases would be woeful, to say the least, uh, at Cheltenham. But it's an interesting one, given she has four magic days and impervious. Obviously, JP as well, perhaps knowing that he's got a decent one with impervious there. So maybe looking down a different route for Dino Blue could be interesting. Doesn't have a mark in Ireland yet. So be interesting next week to see what she gets for that. A bit of a, a bit of an odd one uh, that I like to point out, uh, a French route for David Pipe, who... Until now, we didn't even know he was at the yard, uh, called Archeo Madrick. Uh, had been entered in the plate in the Ultima. He's been second in the grade three last time out, third in the big grade one or toy last May as well. I spoke to Adam, who you might know as Gigi Banker on Twitter, who's my resident French expert. Anytime a horse I don't recognise with French letters next to his name comes over, I go straight to him to, for some advice. And he was fairly positive-ish on him. Like I said, he's definitely better than some of the horses David Pike tends to get in from France these days. Should get a mark of around 140 based on what he has in France. And David Pipe has a very good record in the plate. Like he had a similar type a few years ago called King Sox, who had a prep run about this time and then went on to finish fifth in the plate. I think it went off about eight to one as well. So he'd been an interesting type if lining up. And perhaps the weirdest one in terms of the selection of entries he got was next destination uh, so we haven't seen him since finishing second in the 2021 national one chase behind galvin so he used to be with paul nichols now and nicky henderson he's gone down to a mark 145 but he got entered in the ultima the plate the kim muir and then for some reason the county hurdle which um that would be some prep not seen for two years after finishing second over three mile sticks over fences and then runs in a two mile handicap hurdle as an 11 year old I mean, I mean, it's it's one of the roguest entries I've ever seen, but I really hope he runs. It'd be hilarious. <laughs> oh, that's really tickled me, I have to say. Um, <laughs> it is just that's so random. <laughs> I can only think they've just pushed the it's, wrong button. Uh, either that or it's just, uh, let's just do it to make the the guys on the Jumps podcast have a good laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and she Michelle certainly has. Yeah, exactly. Um, Right, moving on then. We're going to have a look at one more race uh, in hindsight, which, of course, is the Betfair Ascot chase. And saw, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, Shishkin winning, and not just winning, and yet absolutely bolted in. And it was the old Shishkin. It was the Shishkin of yore. So it was great to see that. Ryanair is the aim, probably, but the Gold Cup has been muted. Unfortunately, the champion chase hasn't been muted. Um but that's, uh, that's that's for me to stomach. I mean, I will just bring in the fact that I tweeted on, on the weekend that Shishkin surely goes for the champion chase after that. I'll just explain my reasoning behind that. And that was, if he turns up in the champion chase and can hang on to the coattails of the likes of Energumin, Edderjit and Gentleman Demi, because there's going to be a very strong pace in that race. We've already been through this when I mentioned Nube Negra for the race. Um, I think if he manages to hang on to three out... And I, I like the way that he travelled a lot better than he has done at Sandown at Cheltenham before um, on Saturday. I thought it was much more like his old kind of travelly, sweetly travelly self. Um, so I, I wouldn't have too many concerns in that regard about keeping tabs on, on the front guys. And I, I expect them to come back in the final throws of that race because they're going to go off too hard. And Chishkin, we all know, he stays very strongly. And I think he'd be um, yeah, staying on powerfully up the hill. But apparently, I'd say... 5% of Twitter seems to agree with me on that. So um, <laughs> that's generous. There you go. Yeah. And I think, I think 66% of this podcast disagree with me. Um, but we'll, we'll find out what they think. 
Um, Dan, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think you're insane. Um, <laughs> to be quite honest, um, I think if, if if that situation occurred and he wasn't travelling, like he probably wouldn't, he'd be pulled up after about three fences. I'd say they wouldn't they wouldn't even try dare give him such a hard race. And at this stage, why bother dropping him back? Especially you've got Nuba Negra, Tom. We went over this. Like, why do you <laughs> yeah. why do you want him there? Like, you've got the winner of the race for fourth. Oh, well, you've even, got him there. Mate, like... Even if Shish, even if Shishkin turned up, Nuba Negra would still win. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, of course. Yeah. Jake, we're going to have to talk about getting a new host. I can't take this anymore. <laughs> I can't do this. But to, on on Shishkin, I think I don't know what was better, the performance or the pelters that Tom was getting on Twitter all day for this outrageous <laughs> opinion. Both were fantastic fun to watch. Either way, and it was and like you... it was it, it was it was a world level rinsing, wasn't it? It was like it was. Up there with yeah, and you deserved I mean, it. So... Oh well. <laughs> I, I don't think I did, but I, I know that plenty like you think I do. So fair enough. <laughs> oh, it's a game of opinions. You just happen to have the wrong one. Exactly yeah. that. I've heard, I've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> Too many times. But yeah, look, it was great to see Shishkin back. Like that was the one we we remember fondly. And fair play to Nicky because so I think a few were sceptical about going up in trip. Or was, was it just a fact of whether he was just not the horse he was? But... I think from an early stage, you could tell that this was a much happier horse dropping back in trip, going a yard slower. And it's exactly what Nicky said, to be fair. Like, he thought he'd be much more within himself. And he just travelled so sweetly, jumped so well. Like, they nailed it. Absolutely spot on. And let's not make no bones about it. This was a proper race. Like, I right set out for the first mile at a good gallop. Pictori took it up off him after about a mile, after about circuit, Pictori took it up. And the pace was pretty relentless throughout. Finishing speeds dictate that Pictori was like 94%, 95% finishing speed. And Shishkin throughout traveled the best and then stayed on very impressively. And what it was a very stiff test. That was a proper two and a half mile performance. Now, I know a lot of people are thinking Gold Cup. And obviously, if you look at his pedigree, there are reasons to think that a three mile trip plus would be up his street. I would say that just because he's down one a few points doesn't necessarily mean that's stamina because two milers win points. So that would be a somewhat of a negative on that regard. But at this stage, I don't see why you would necessarily go for the Gold Cup. And I know I'm a big advocate of competition, but I think in a horse like Shishkin's case where it hasn't been straightforward for a year or so now, we've only just kind of got him back to his best. He clearly isn't a horse who lacks speed. We know that. Two and a half seemed to be his ideal situation at this point. And I think if you're looking to step him up in trip anytime soon, maybe the goal all going well in the Ryanair would be the King George. Like that would be the kind of middle ground test to see if he's got Gold Cup stamina. I think three miles around there would probably be a really good test for him. Given and and if, imagine if we get Brayman's game, Shishkin and, and co line up there, that would be something to look forward to over Christmas. So lovely to see from Shishkin, right Ryanair favourite, the only one seventy plus horse in that race if he goes. And if he goes in that form, he'll win. And there's no question about it. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely bang on with that. And it's interesting, isn't it, that Gold Cup route um, and missing it this year, going the King George, as you say, and then waiting for the Gold Cup next year. Jake, do you think that's the, the right route to take as well? Yeah, I, I love their plan. They've got the minute. They're going to go for the Ryanair. Then they may even take it in the Aintree Bowl um, as, yeah, as a you know, first start over three miles, which I think would be a perfect place to start because obviously Aintree's a pretty easy track to get the trip so yeah i think go there then next year you know all guns blazing for that for that king george clash um with brave Run's game at all and yeah hopefully hopefully it will go well um in terms of his performance on saturday i thought yeah just thought it was brilliant and it was just you could see from the first couple of fences couldn't you that he was just traveling powerfully he was enjoying it um i know it's all these cliches that people come out with after a performance like that but i thought it was you know actually rang true this time um, it was completely different to his last two runs where you could tell again straight away that he wasn't enjoying it. So yeah, it was, it was good to see him back. Um, there wasn't really exactly that much confidence about him. Obviously, Fakir Duderiz ended up getting off the 74 favourite, but he he put up a bit of a no-show really. I wouldn't say he ran to, to his level of form, but um, perhaps he's progressing. We, we, we know, we'll, I guess we'll, that remains to be seen in future performances. Um, but him and Peak Dory, I, I'd say that they should both, well, Peak Dory is definitely going to wait till entry. And I'd probably say Fakadudri should probably freshen up for that now as well. Yeah, they had hard races there. Yeah. I and mean, Fakir didn't really look happy at any stage, did he? Like his jumping was pretty slow and he was out of his ground away from home, to be fair. Pictori ran a stormer. That was probably a career best from him. Yeah, you know, given definitely. the opposition he was taking on here compared to previous. So 
you know, if he can go to Aintree and not meet a rival of Shishkin's calibre, he'll run a good race there, given his run style as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. I thought Pick Dole here on an absolute cracker. Uh, right, moving on to trying to increase our anti-post portfolio. And this week, I'm going to start with Jake. And I know that you've got a fancy for the Kim Muir and a fancy for the Ballymore. Yes. Um, I'll just quickly, I mean, I'll do the, the Kim Muir in full and then I'll just give a quick case for the Ballymore. But um, yeah, so I'll start, start with the Kim Muir and it's Am I Right? Um, so basically this horse... He, he's entered it. He's entered in the old, uh, in the Kim Yard today, which is great. He's also in the Brown Advisory, and there is a caution that he could go to the Brown Advisory, but it's an online no bet there, so I want to get it into the book, and I hope that a, a, a decent handicap mark will, will sway them into into this race. Um, but yeah, if, if you look for his profile, I mean, he, he was a fairly qu- quietly campaigned novice hurdler. Um, he won his point to point, and then yeah, was was kept as to pretty low company over novice in novice hurdles last season. But this year, he, he's done really well over fences. Um, so he started up at Fairy House and he won a two mile five beginners chase and he, he, he jumped really well from day one. Um, he, he was battling his stable mate that day. Uh, she was a mare called Secret She Keeps and, he, you know, so obviously he was trying to give her seven pounds. Um, I had a good battle up the straight and, and when, when he needed a good jump at the last, he just came out of Rachel's hands and, and just completely winged it, um, went on and won it, uh, fairly well. It, it, it had to battle for it, but he managed to get there and, and it was probably a shade cosier than the, the winning margin suggests, but they also pulled 47 lengths clear of the third. So it was, a, you know, it was a proper performance. Um, and then after that, he, he went on to the, uh, the grade two, two mile six fell on Florida Pearl at Punches Sounds. He was chucked straight into a grade race. And I thought he you know, ran another good race to finish third there where he was behind Darren's Hope, um, who, who was, who's a mayor who was primed for that. And Medella Karuna was, was in second. So two decent pieces of form there. Um, he was infamously pushed off, uh, uh, well, obviously Rachel was infamously pushed off by Jack Kennedy um, at Leopardstown over Christmas. Um, but then he returned in the Grade 3 Nace Novice Chase um, a couple of weeks ago, where he was third behind Ramillies and the Devil's Coachman, who I think are two very decent horses. Um, and uh, Henry de Bromhead since said that, that he didn't really like the soft ground that day either. So to only be beaten six lengths when the ground's not in your favour, I think that's, that marks a good horse. He's been given a mark of 138 in Ireland. So I think it's really going to depend on what the British handicapper does as to where they run. Because if he, if he only gets given a couple of pounds, then I think that the Kim will, will be a very, very tempting proposition for them. Um, if he gets like the full whack, gets a full seven pounds towards the head of the weights, maybe they'll just give it a miss. But it's also interesting that Barry O'Neill is on is on Henry's Bromhead's books. And, you know, he's normally his number one call for, for these amateur rider races. So if you could get Barry O'Neill on, that would just be the absolute dream. But let's just see if we get to the race first. So non-runner, no bet at 14 to 1, he'll be my first pick. And then the second pick is actually another Henry de Bonhead horse. And it's going to be in the pocket for the Ballymore. Um, so basically... Is that the, a great year, Henry? Him, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the case for him is basically quite simple. Um, he, he was a very good winner on his debut. He then went straight to it to, into a grade two um, nace novice chase, which was actually run at Navin due to the, of the frost that we had in December. It got delayed. Um, and he was a very, very good winner over two and a half miles where he beat Free Card Bragg, who was obviously staying on, and he's going to be an Albert Barton contender. And Absolute Notions was 4.5 lengths behind as well. So, like, I thought that was a proper performance. I know that the last hurdle was out, but he really showed stamina and speed. And then, unfortunately, because of that race being delayed, he didn't have enough time to then go to the Lawless and Ace, which is what obviously normal winners of that race would do. Um, so he missed that race and they, they had to get him out somewhere. So they just ran him in the two mile novice hurdle at the Dublin Racing Festival, which I think is the, like just has given him so much experience and, and ability to be able to travel because he just, the Faso Vega obviously, as we know, set a really strong pace that day, but he was able to cruise in, in, in that pace without any bother. Like he wasn't being pushed along. He wasn't, um, you know, being stoked along at, at any point. He, he was just able to cruise at that pace. And then when they quickened again, when Elete Thompson went on to go and win the race, Dark Raven came past him. Um, but he showed stamina at that point to then get past Dark, Dark Raven again and finish second in the race. So I think he's got everything you need in a Ballymore contender. And his price of 12 to 1 currently, I think that's a bit of value each way. Henry de Romhead has come out in a stable tour today and said that the Ballymore is the aim for him unless it's really soft ground. Um, but, you know, 12 to 1 is not running no bet. So, again, we'll, we'll have it covered if, if, if that did happen. But I just think he's got everything you need in a Ballymore contender. And I think he's got a great chance. Dark yeah, Raven's really form. Case, it's all about <laughs> Dark Raven. I told you. It's all about him. He ties you the know, whole I, festival I together. 
Yeah, I would say Black Raven would have a good chance in the race as well if he, if he turns up. But it's obviously, supreme is the word that on Willie's lips at the minute. So you've got to hope that he doesn't do it's that. It's weird, though. Like, that was a quote. Then I saw him literally speak and he said, oh, he could go to Ballymore as well. So I'd be yeah. careful about that. They're, they're often misquoted. Sometimes they just take the first thing they hear. But he did mention both races. So the dream's alive. He did. Somewhat. Lovely stuff. Thanks very much indeed, Jake. Right, moving on to you, Dan. What do you fancy for the handicaps or indeed for anything else, anti-post? Oh, you know me too well. Of course it's a handicap. We've had handicap entries day. How could it not be a handicap? I've been doing it for weeks anyway, but now I actually have horses to look at. I actually know who might run. Like that's much more information than I've ever needed to, to get stuck in. And we alluded to this one earlier. Uh, I pretty much gave it away by saying I'm not going to talk about him earlier because, well, yeah, it was it was pretty obvious. But for the county hurdle, a horse we all know, he's been around the block so many times, but I just can't help myself. And that's Charger who you can back at 14 to 1, nominal no bet for the county hurdle. And look, we know this is a race Willie Mullins has borderline farmed in recent years. Obviously, in, in recent years, it's been the likes of State Man and something wild, like the unexposed types, but it's not always been. And if you look at this year at his entries, I'm not sure there's one in there that fits that kind of mold. You've got Hunter Jean, who's at the head of the market, but I think he's off 143 in Ireland. I think obviously they could just go straight to Supreme with him. Whether he's quite ready for a race like the county, I'm not really sure. They could just go stick to graded company. Illete Thompson in there, but I can only imagine that's cautionary in case he picks up a knock on and he can't run on the Tuesday, for example. And other than that, like there aren't those really young progressive novices. And again, it might be the new rule that's kind of interrupted that plan, perhaps. But it has been in the past the classier, more exposed types that have come to the fore. It's the Arctic Fire in 2017 defied a 418 day absence. Uh, to win off 158. Like he'd been previously second in the champion hurdle to Faheen, uh, one that happens Grace, for example, like a proven grade one level performer. And then a couple of years ago, we had Aramon, who was off 149, finished second to Saint Moir that year. He was a grade one winning novice hurdler, fifth to Honeysuckle in the Irish champion hurdle to start before that. And even in recent years, outside of Willie Mullins, we've seen proven graded horses come to the county hurdle and run really well. Like Petit Mouchois was second in 2021. And he was coming in really in no sort of form, or at least relative to Charger. He'd been well beaten in two grade ones and then would finish second in the Red Mills, but well beaten by Jason Militant. And that's exactly where Charger just finished, uh, chasing home Phil Dore, as we discussed earlier. Look, the fact that he couldn't win there was a tad disappointing, but I think there's plenty of reasons to forgive him that run. Firstly, he made a really bad mistake down the back. That's the second race in a row he's done that. Did the same against State Man. And I think it was the second uh, at that time. And obviously that just put him on the back foot early on. He did recover well, but you can't make an error like that really uh, and expect to win readily. And I, I saw an interview with Patrick earlier today, like literally 20 minutes before he hopped on this call. And uh, he said, once he walked the track and saw the time of the first race, he realized they were probably in trouble with him. Because obviously he's is a horse who's traditionally always wanted quick ground. And it was clearly on the soft side of, of soft or even closer to heavy based on all the times and what we saw there. So it probably explains why he didn't perhaps travel as sweetly as we know he can. And in the end, like it wasn't a disgraceful performance. He's tactically that race wouldn't have suited him because it was slowly run and he had to make up ground from the back on ground. He would have hated. So completely willing to forgive him that effort. And obviously before that he'd been second to state man in the Morgiana and inferred to him in the Matheson. Like he hasn't been running woefully at all. And the Irish handicap has dropped him from a mark in the one sixties down to one five, five. Now I can't imagine given he's had 20 plus runs over hurdles and he's a 10 year old, the British handicap is going to give him too much more. They don't tend to anyway with those ones towards the head of the weights. It's only the novices they really tend to hit down hard on. I think when Aramon got one, four, nine, I think he was one, four, eight in Ireland. Like he don't tend to go mad with them. And ultimately this is going to be his first handicap run. Should he go here since 2018? And he hacked up in it off one, four, six. Like he's been consistently in these grade ones ever since that win. Effectively, this is a horse that's been second in two champion hurdles. We know better ground, which he's likely to get here, he's going to suit. And I think given his run style, you can expect a, a county hurdle to really suit him. We know he likes to be held up. He's a strong traveller. And ultimately, you can imagine a scenario where, if it is Patrick who rides him, and I, I imagine it will be, where he's come in there absolutely cruising on that long run to the last. Whether he then might find one or two a bit too young, a bit too progressive for him, potentially so. But I think there's every chance he's bang there come the last and given a horse of his class, given what he's still been doing this season and the season before, 
I think he's got a race in him like this, and that class carries you a long way in a race like the County Hurdle. So a 14 to 1 for a trainer who knows what it takes to bring one like him to this race. Uh, I can see him, if he does go, going off at least probably high single figures, uh, given his profile, and I can see him running very close. Yeah, it's a really interesting shout that I have to say, Dan. Uh, a very classy horse, as you say. He's got that lovely turn of foot. Travels really strongly, and uh, we know that he likes Cheltenham as well. So, yeah, definitely you can see that for sure. Uh, I'm going to put up two this week. Um, first up, I'm going to go Handicaps for the first time, actually. And one of the more obvious, you might think, but uh, he certainly wasn't obvious in the race last year when he finished third, and that was Oscar Elite. So I have to say, I was on last year at 40 to 1 for the race, and I thought, here we go, we're in the money. <laughs> coming to two out because he was traveling all over them. He was jumping for fun and he looked to have plenty left in the tank. But as it happens, he was run out of it for third by Corrick Rambler. Now, this is a horse who is only one pound higher than for that performance last year, following, of course, his quite impressive win on Saturday in the Reynolds Town when he got raised four pounds. And um, he beat a pretty good yardstick, I would say, back in second on Saturday. And uh, I think this is a horse who needs to be given a more conservative ride in the race because last year he went far too wide. He was 10 wide all the way around pretty much, particularly coming down the hill. And I think that extra yardage he had to travel probably cost him a little bit in the end and maybe was the reason why in the final half furlong or so he cried enough. I think maybe just over that trip, he needs to be just conserved a little bit more, hopefully a year older or a year wiser as well. He wouldn't be the most, oh, wow, I, I, why are you choosing Oscar Elite? But I've had plenty of those in the series so far. So I thought I'd go for something <laughs> a little bit more conventional. And for me, he'd be, he's a horse, I have to say, I've always liked when he finished second in the out a long, long time behind him. Um, I thought it was a massive run. He wasn't really expected to do much that day. But he'd run Cheltenham very well indeed. So I think that's, that's a big positive to his chance. Totally got a strong person. I can see him going very, very close off just a pound hard, as I say. Another one I'm going to put up is <laughs> even more, Pat, even more of the fans' game, the Gold Cup. I just wanted to talk about this horse, really, because he's getting the credit that he deserves at all. Um, he's a King George winner. He did it very easily. He beat Lon Presti, who literally jumped out to his left a little bit, but he beat him easily. He would have done it if Lon Presti hadn't unseen, but you know, he had him well and truly covered after the He was a horse who went pretty wide around the whole way. Harry Cobden said afterwards he wanted to do that on purpose just to keep him out of trouble, but that was impressive, the way that he came off the bridle, coming into the home straight, and then back on it when he came to Lon Presse, and then went clear again in the closing stages. There's, for me, there's no doubt in my mind he's going to stay three miles, two and a half, particularly after what Paul Nichols has said about him and the fact that he's a completely different horse this year. He goes up the gallop three times rather than once or twice in the past, and he's been too tired to go up another time. Now he hits the third time, and he's, and he's absolutely fine. He's loving it. He can go again. Um, he is a horse who is being crabbed or perhaps pigeonholed as a flat track bully, which I really don't think is fair at all. And I think what people are thinking of, they're putting him in the same bracket as Clanders Oboe, who obviously won two King Georges and then came back to the Gold Cup and wasn't really the same horse. But he still didn't run too badly. But I think people just thought Clanders Oboe, he's, he's, he's a much better on a flat track, which I think was probably true. But Brayman's game has definitely got plenty of time to prove himself completely fine at Cheltenham. Let's not forget when he ran behind Bob Ollinger in the Ballymore a couple of years ago, he ran pretty well. He was a weak, immature horse then coming off the back of a shallow hurdle that the form wasn't particularly strong. And he ran against two very, very good hurdles at the time, Bob Ollinger and Guy Dumerny. He finished third. No disgrace whatsoever, just off the coattails of them and showed that he handles Cheltenham. So I don't really understand where this is coming from, that, that Brave Man's game isn't going to handle Cheltenham. He wants to be on a flat track because I think there's no reason to think he won't perform very well. And let's not forget, too, he is the best jumper in the race. There is no denying that. He barely scrapes a twig. I think in his start so far this season, the Charlie Horton, the King George, he's not really made any kind of semblance of a mistake. So he is, for me, the best jumper in the race. I think that will stand him in good stead, particularly over the extra two and a quarter miles. And that's uh, two and a half miles or so. And for me, yeah, he's, he's a massive, massive player. And I think he deserves a lot more respect and a lot more credit than he's been given. So hopefully he'll run a big race as well as Austria Elite. So hopefully Tuesday and Friday are going to be successful for me. Interesting. Now, we've all got a horse in the Ultima. Um, so I think we're going to have to think of a forfeit for the worst finisher. I think it's only fair. In fact, if you've got one, suggest them down below. Keep them PG, please. Like, we're not going to streak across Cheltenham. 
um, <laughs> at least sober. Um, so if you've got any creative suggestions for the, the worst finisher in the Ultima, get them down below. I'd be very interested to hear them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's a great shout. I really, really hope that isn't me as well. I just feel like the way, I feel like the, the way this podcast has been going, like it's almost certainly going to be me as well. Um, no, I think you're fairly but, safe because I think Oscar Elite would come there traveling like the winner and finish about fifth. Uh, but I think that'll be solid. Um, <laughs> I think you've got a good one there. Um, I think I'm the one in trouble because I've got the biggest price, but bring it on. I'm here to play. Wow. Let's not mess around. Yeah. Luckily, you're a judge, so uh, you know, that's definitely <laughs> that's not many favorite. say that these days. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lads, thanks very much. It's been great fun. As always, my friend, as always. Yeah, thanks very much, Tom. Yeah, cheers, Jake, and cheers, Dan. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, please do like our video, subscribe to the channel, and do comment below with your best handicap. Best. That's it for this week on The Jump Show. Please do join us again next time for more anti-post selections. <laughs>